Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today I have an amazing, insightful interview to share with you. Before we get into it, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. My merch is displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadalny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description below. Finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, click that like button, and please leave a comment. It really does help, and guys, it definitely matters. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with this amazing subscriber interview shall we all right everybody today i have a very special guest um i've had this person on a while back i narrated his tennessee encounters just recently uh, a lot of you know him and you've heard him um from a couple different interviews on my show and a couple other shows but this guy knows so much about so many different things because of where he lives and what he's done. Tonight, I have Donald Coleman Jr. with us. How are you tonight, sir? I'm fine. You can just call me Don. How about that? I know that, sir. But it, it is a pleasure having you back on. Um, a lot of people haven't heard... Uh, you know, I've got a lot of new subs, so they may have not heard what you've went through and what you've what you've lived. So I kind of want to, you know, just kind of go over a few things with you. Um, and I know you've had the last thing I kind of want to talk about is the reptilian encounter that you've had. But I kind of okay. want to let everybody know who you are and what you've experienced. So when did you kind of become aware of there is something else besides deer and raccoon and possum out in the woods. Well, the, I heard I had an encounter way back in '81 at when I was a police officer, and while I was on duty, and I did not, I first dis disclosed that on uh, Oklahoma Dogman Sasquatch Dogman Sasquatch Oklahoma encounters with. Dr. Lance Hightower, when I was a police officer, uh, I was on patrol one night. I kept hearing large, like somebody was running a, a bush hog. And it was like, uh, at first heard it, I went on duty at midnight, about 2 o'clock in the morning. I was hearing that noise. And it was over by Hassel Hughes Lumber Company, which is off of Highway 13, Tennessee Highway 13 South. It's kind of snakes through downtown Collinwood. Collinwood. And uh, anyway, I walked around the building, and uh, it's a small building. I walked around it, and I had my uh, shotgun out. I got my police shotgun out because I didn't know what I was going to encounter. And... Um, I, I smelled an odd smell. I thought maybe the sewer line, you know, broke it or something mm -hmm. like that. And it just alerted me to that area, and I shined my spotlight on the police car all around it, uh, you know, up in the trees a little bit. And uh, so I went back. I said, well, maybe it's my imagination. And I went back on patrol, and I uh, so I, I turned my patrol car. I was in town by this water tower there. And there's a little park underneath it, and Hassel Hughes was like a hundred yards from where I was sitting. So I turned my whole radio off and everything, and just listened. And I could hear that brush popping again. You know, it sounded like uh, a ice storm that's heavy laden on limbs, and it snaps, mm -hmm. and it sounds like a shotgun going off. Okay. And so it Wait. alerted me back over there. I had actually gone back to HQ. I felt really sick into my stomach and I went back to HQ 
and uh, got some, you know, something, the Pepsi Bismol or something to calm us. I took about a 15 minute break, went back over there. It's about uh, three thirty, something like that. And uh, I said, I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna park down the street. I think it was a gravel road then. It's paved now, but I think it was gravel. And I had on patent leather shoes, so you know they could hear me coming. You know, I, I really couldn't get a good sneak, so I went over to the ditch line that had a lot of Johnson grass in it, and it was it was up to my neck. I'm six foot five, and it's up to my neck, and uh, I'm wading through it with the shotgun out. I, ha- I clipped my 357, and I had my KL flashlight out, and uh, I creeped up there. And I, I started shining my flashlight a little higher in the tree line. And I saw a pair of glowing red eyes looking down from me. Because that really scared me right there. I go, I didn't know what it was. And I saw a pair of glowing red eyes. And then I heard a like a guttural growl. And I go, I thought, I shouldn't be afraid. But then it, I really kind of... It kind of hit my lower stomach, and uh, it, you know, instantly my it's like a dog when a dog scared their hair goes up on the back of their uh, neck, mm-hmm. and it was kind of like that. And I have a I have a great sixth sense, and I I said I, some came over said you fix to get into something you don't want to get into, you know. I, I thought well I got a shotgun a three fifty seven magnum. I, who should I be afraid of like that? I'm, you know, having this conversation and I finally dropped down and it was like, I think it was the Lord telling me drop down right now, face first. You're going to get into something like that. I go, this is insane. Uh, you know, I'm not, a, I was real gung ho back in those days. I kind of remind myself as a, uh, uh, on third watch, uh, that, guy that's always hyper i think his actor's name was jason wiles they called him bosco okay and i was i had a bosco attitude back then and uh boscarelli that's what they called him and anyway i went down on the ground and as i was going down this thing st- stood up and and it was uh, it, was, it was at least 13 feet off the ground and it and it took a it took a hard hard step from the tree line and i mean the ground shook wow i go good god what am i getting into mm. and so i looked up i could see i was glowing red eyes and he was right under the trees you know right at the edge of the road and and i i look out he, he stepped two steps toward me mm-hmm. and and then i took the safety off the shotgun and, and about that time i pulled that 357 out and cocked it I thought, well, I don't want to get into this with this, whatever this is. I don't want it because because about 50 feet from where he was was a row of about six houses shaped in a horseshoe like that. And uh, I was afraid I was going to get in a gunfight and somebody would get injured or killed, you know, like collateral damage, which I didn't want. And so I just laid there real quiet, real still, and it grunted a couple of times and then just turned around and walked back through the tree line and walked back. And, uh, at that time I just lost my bowels. I mean, I just crapped myself real bad. Right. And, uh, and it was, it was such a tremendous fear that came over me. I waited about 15 minutes, crawled on my hands and knees, put my guns up, put the safeties back on, crawled on my hands and knees, got my patrol car, went to the and i had i mean it was diarrhea down both both legs yeah. horrific event real quick and so uh, uh, really quick do you think now i had thought about this um when you had mentioned previously that you had a stomach ache earlier in the night now do you think it could have been the smell or do you think it could have been some sort of like I don't know, not a mental, like, not, not like telekinesis, but maybe some sort of mental, um, re inner reaction with what was going on that, 
that made your stomach hurt so bad? No, I had a stomach ache before I went on duty because I worked from 12 midnight to 8 a.m. I had to do the school crossing and stuff. Okay, okay. so you were so, already uh, sick. I was already sick. Okay, all and, right. You know, and I had, at that time, I was living with the chief of police. We were splitting an apartment, and he was, you know, I didn't want to wake him up going in and have a change of clothes and all that stuff. So I thought I just, uh, so I went back to the fire department and got in the shower with my full uniform on. Of course, I took my utility belt off and gun and all that, put it on the counter and took a cold shower. Then I took a hot shower and I took a cold shower. And then I, I took my strip down just about naked and, uh, <laughs> just, you know, soak my clothes in the shower to let the water run, you know, clean the, crap off my clothes and then i went and got, i was real shaking real bad and uh, i went and got the fire department blanket off one of the fire trucks yeah and i wrapped up behind the i wrapped up turned the lights off into the uh fire hall i had my ko with me and i laid down there man i lost it i lost it. i lost everything i mean not my vows i'm talking about emotional mental breakdown yeah just crying. And I cried like, I mean, it's like I got the worst beating ever, you yeah. know. Yeah. And so uh, I cleaned it up real good. And I, You know, I know how to get something dry. And you know, I use a lot of towels and all that stuff. And it still was, you know, of course, it was damp and cold. And I tried to clean up the show car as best I could. And then I went down to Melvin's. It's a restaurant on 13 South, just about a quarter of a mile down the road from where I was sitting at that water tower. And, uh, and Melvin goes, you, you look like hell. I said, Melvin, I don't feel like talking right now. Just give, give me a cup of coffee. So I, you know, stay awake longer. And, uh, I never, I found some hairs about 13 feet up in the tree and I got a ladder and I went back after every bad hassle use had gone home for the day. And I went back and I found two or three hairs, black hairs, and I saw a footprint that was uh, 20 inches, and it was six inches across at the heel. Wow. And I, I could have, you know, plaster cast that thing and turn those hairs in, and I thought, who is going to believe this? You know? Yeah. I mean, I'm having, I just witnessed it i saw it but who is going to believe this since i just got out of the academy i covered the evidence up burn up the hairs and and you know uh covered it up i didn't measure the the footprint and it was in white gravel rock but it it made an impression that's how heavy this thing was yeah that's it yeah and you know it's 80 80 what 82 81 81. It wasn't talked about like it is nowadays. I mean, the Gimlin film had just come out. You know, you had some books here and there. Yeah. It wasn't. Well, anything. I thought it was up in the. I thought. I thought Folk, Arkansas, probably has it. Mm. And then over there in the Pacific Northwest, I never knew these cryptids were all around us the yeah. whole time. Yeah. No. Yeah. You're right. You know, it's crazy. Like, you turned me on to. Uh, Tim Baker, Kunbo. Yeah. And, you know, he, in his investigations, he, it was, you know, I've learned so much from him just talking to him. He automatically assumed all these things were, were Bigfoot. And then he, he realized one at one night that he had misidentified a lot of these things and said, well, I need to go back and look. A lot of these encounters were dog man. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's because there wasn't it wasn't talked about so widely back then, you know. I mean, we have we're at a great time in in uh, research because we have the internet, we have the capability of communicating with everybody and anybody nowadays. You know, it was it was hard back when you were you were starting out. You know, 
you know, it was uh, it was never talked about, and mm. and all these uh, uh, like uh, Cock County up in East Tennessee. I went to the law enforcement academy with a lot of those deputies up there, yeah. and not n- nothing was ever said about this stuff. I never heard it, even when I went to LBL with my cousin Scott and been up in Grand River, Kentucky. Never heard anybody say anything because I didn't know these things existed until Lon Stryker told me back in 2015 when I was on his show, when I wrote the whole storyline and sent it in to him, and he he acted like he didn't want to believe me. And I said, well, Lon, I said, if anybody's not believable is your stories up there, wherever you're from, you know, some of the stuff you said, I'd, if I was in law enforcement, I'd put you in protective custody and investigate you <laughs> for making comments like that. Right. You know, I said, I'm telling you the truth. And so he contacted somebody around Scott County and he goes, he's telling the truth. Yeah. Look, speaking of which, you just mentioned Cott County. Um, you're, you're in Tennessee. What do you think about the, those two cases that happened up there? What, what's your opinion on that? The Amber Miller and the Tony Aaron's case, same road, you know, roughly two months apart. How do you feel about that? Oh, it's dog man. They're covering it up. Yeah. yeah, it's dog man. I mean, I mean, what would tear somebody up like that? Yeah, and yeah. then sometimes, and a lot of times, big. I mean, big. Excuse me, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, a lot of times, it's not what they're saying is what they're not saying. Yep. There's a key right there. What are they not saying? And, it, and of course, if we do have bears, I we got bears in Hardin County. I didn't know it until somebody uh, caught it on the Facebook uh, camera and and filmed it up by Pickwick Dam. I didn't know that, mm-hmm. but Tim Kumbo Baker told me. He said that's why they named it Bear Creek because back when they were forming Pickwick Lake, there were bear back in there. Yeah. Tim, Tim's, up, a, up. Tim's like an encyclopedia of knowledge on cryptids. Man. Tim is like a PhD in cryptozoology. <laughs> yeah, he is a great he, guy. <laughs> he he knows he knows things, and many if he doesn't know things, he'll tell you he doesn't know. Yeah, no, he will. Now you had after that, what was, what were you thinking? You you kind of just kind of let it go until you. Had no, I got, I got out. Of, I I left Collinwood and. I thought I'd go back to uh, a restaurant uh, hotel management. So I got a job at uh, J.P. Seafields. Mm-hmm. It was a 425-seat restaurant in Germantown. And I worked out there for about six, seven months. Then I left and I went into security. And I went into, uh, they put me at Holiday Inns. They started at uh, Night Arnold Lamar. And then I moved up to Union Avenue. Uh, Holiday Inn, and then I ended up at the Holiday in Rivermont, which is a 14-story uh, Memphis and stuff. It's high as far as the elevation is and stuff. Okay. And uh, and the guy, I, I really, I really did my job really well. And the guy called me up, and he was over the whole Holiday Inn. He said, "I'm impressed with the reports you file every night. I can tell you do your job." I said, "Oh, I'm gonna do my job." And everything, and he 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 took me back in the kitchen, and man, I'm talking about, he had, uh, it was like a showroom of all the food they served there at the Holiday Inn. That's fourteen, that's eight or nine stories there, you know, four that's fourteen stories. That's that's how many rooms they had. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. You keep writing those reports. Anything you want to eat, you get it, you fix it, and you write it down, put it on my I cover it. Like that, I said, "Well, nobody's ever treated me that nice." Right. And so, I, what I did is, I went out and fed a bunch of my workers out in the guard shack and all that. I said, "Look, you do your job. You know, you you need me for something. You have them pays me inside the holiday. I mean, the river mine. I come out here and help you. And I took care of my people and stuff. And uh, and so I I did that for a while. I got kind of got missing law enforcement. So I got a job at South Fulton Police Department as a public safety officer, which that means we, we did fire and police. When the fire trucks 
went out. We we were part time firemen. You were kind of. Stuff. Were you? Is that where you were dispatching to, or no? Yeah, I was dispatching there. The one I was working the seven a seven p.m. to three a.m. shift. She went home at one. I had to go in and dispatch. This is before nine one one. Right. And and this is when I got that call about a woman saying she had a home invasion. So I knew what to ask for. I said, "Ma'am, are do you work at a, a a federally funded bank? Are you a bank teller? No, I'm not. I don't work at a bank." I said, "Okay." Because so if she said she did, I called the FBI mm-hmm. immediately and stuff. But I I said, "Well, ma'am, where are you located?" And it's O V I O N is O'Brien because you and you live in the South. It's pronounced that way. You know, it's probably supposed. To be, it's probably supposed to be O'Brien, o- 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 but that it's O'Brien Sheriff, uh, Sheriff's Department. And she was in the northeast corner of O'Brien County up to Weekly on the Kentucky State line. I said, why don't you call those other uh, people, those Sheriff's Departments in, in Kentucky and uh, in Tennessee? And she goes, well, you're the only one answer the phone. Mm. I said, yeah, they do go to bed at night. And... Uh, <laughs> Well, they did. I mean, that's where it was. Right. And, and so I I had a funny feeling that this was a bogus call. Mm-hmm. I mean, instantly I had that feeling. So I said, well, ma'am, uh, I said, I can't send a unit from our, because you're out of my jurisdiction, but I'll, I'll see if I can help you further. So I got on the low band and called the Memphis uh, District of the Tennessee Highway Patrol. I said, I need to speak to commanding officer ASAP 1033 emergency traffic. Have him call me on public service, which is a telephone. Back then, back yeah. then, he called me up. He's a captain. He said, "What do you have?" I told him. I said, "It's a home invasion. They got they're holding cat uh, two people hostage. The one was upstairs under bed. Call me." I said, "I think this is a bogus call, but how do you want to proceed? Because I need I'll I'll, I'll need your uh, mutual aid assistance on this." Because I, I can't, he's out of my jurisdiction. How do you want to proceed? First thing out of his mouth, how far is this from LBL? Mm. I go, what the hell does this got to do with LBL? I said, probably 100 miles. You know, I was just guessing. And uh, he said, we're going to treat it like a real call. Now, that ought to tell you something right there. Yeah, yeah. What was what was the lady saying? Did She, she was she... saying that two guys broke into her home and she was already going upstairs, and she ran on upstairs and slid under the bed, and they were ha- holding her daughter and her boyfriend hostage. Okay. And so she started calling all these, and she called me, and I thought, uh, and when she said that, I said, and she did not work for a bank, I thought, why would they be doing it at 1 o'clock in the morning, you know, in South Fulton, I mean, O'Brien County of all places. That mm-hmm. don't make sense. Right. And stuff. So then, I just felt, I felt like it was a bogus call, and it was. Right, but then the captain made that made that statement, and that was what only, God, what seven eight months after. Yeah, seven eight months. If 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 it happened in March or April, this was about the middle of December, the end of the year of nineteen eighty two. Mm-hmm. If it happened, then I don't know. I've heard eighty two, eighty three, but whatever, whenever it happened. That's what that officer asked. The captain said, how far is this from LBL? And I'm going, of course, I didn't know that the murders happened in the LBL at all. Right. You know, and it's, it's like, I remember things like that, you know, and I'm going, what are we talking about? Mm. You know, so he he treated it, and he, we sent so many people it looked like the Sugar Land Express on that movie that Goldie Hawn was in. And they, I bet we had 30 agencies out there. And I mean, we had ambulance, rescue squads. We took the fire department out there. Wow. And it was a bogus call. And the woman lived by herself. Wow. Wow. But and that she got does... 11 months and 29 days of county jail. <laughs> Good. But that does show that something really happened in the LBL. Just, yeah, you know, and because but I didn't find out about the LBL till 2015. Yeah, yeah. Now, and so anyway, 
if you look at my Sasquatch encounter, I, I, I called it the shadow creature, mm-hmm. what I called it in 81, almost to the, almost to the month. And, and in August of 91, I had my first dog man encounter. All right. And that's when it ran across the road from Harpensville road across state highway 35 in Mississippi around Scott County, Scott and Lake County. And it ran across the road heading actually toward where my park is. And, uh, we, uh, that thing was eight feet on all fours. It had a hyena head and a lion's mane, but the markings didn't add up. And that's what confused me there. And of course, the other, uh, uh, show was saying I I didn't believe you at first, but then the, he remembered a, a story. A state trooper said the same thing, hmm. and so I told I told him what happened. I said it freaked me out so bad I got, I I wanted to get out of the car, you know. And it was pitch black dark. I was a stupid boot and me to make, and and my wife and she had her two kids with us. And she says, don't you think about getting out of this car. Just get in and get out of here, yeah. you know, like that. And I just wanted to see you. Did I just see that? That's how fast these things move. Yeah. And people don't realize it. I mean, they move. I mean, I was doing 55. I saw I, I saw something coming out of the, <clears throat> on the right, on my right side. Uh, and I hit the high beams. And that's what caught it coming right toward my car. And, you know, if I hadn't slammed on the brakes, I was doing about 55, 60, and he was moving at that speed. And if I hadn't slammed on my brakes, I'd have hit that thing, you know, T-boned it. Right. So uh, that was the first dog man encounter I had. And it so freaked her out so bad. And she said, don't you talk about it. You may lose your job if you bring it up. And I go, well, that's probably true. And so I covered that one up. I covered a bunch of stuff up because I didn't want to lose my job. Right. Yeah. And, and here I was, a law enforcement officer. You yeah, know, you both were, times. You were working at the park as like a, a game Mississippi uh, Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, mm-hmm. and Parks. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And then it was called the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, when I first went to a gold memorial, then it became the uh, wildlife fisheries and parks and then about 1990 a, a federal park ranger in Gulfport got killed in the line of duty and before I left the park service they were sending everybody to the law enforcement training academy in Mississippi I thought why do I have to go over I just need to qualify on the on the gun range I've already been through six weeks of the, uh, Tennessee's law enforcement academy and stuff and so uh, I Thankfully, I left the uh, department and moved up to my second wife's hometown in Savannah, Tennessee, at Hardin County. Hmm. And then, you know, it was 95. I had a, my old 72 Cutlass. Mom and Dad and I were driving down to Iuka uh, from Pickwick. is about, uh, about 20 miles, something like that, 20, 22 miles. And we were looking at landscape, how people landscape around their home stuff, just kind of give us an idea of what we need to do, especially at her home in Savannah, Tennessee. And it was at, I saw top in the hill at Gold Island, the Carnton County Railroad overpass bridge, we ran across Highway 25. There was a church and a cemetery in the background and a red brick ranch style home that was closer to the uh the the uh railroad overpass bridge in the levee the railroad and between gold island road and elks landing road which both go to yellow creek that's the where the 10 time waterway is yellow creek this thing comes out at 10 o'clock in the morning broad daylight but it was overcast cloudy and uh it was still you know, the leaves hadn't come on the trees yet. It's early part of March. Comes out on all fours, uh, and it, I thought, it looked like the size of a big black cow. I go, wait a minute, there ain't no black cow. 
and it was another dogman creature. But this one was solid black. I got, I sped up, it crossed my car in front of me. And I was a half a car length just before I got up to it. And I saw that thing, solid black, solid black eyes. He went over to the, uh, about 25, 30 yards, it was a ravine. He got down and went down in that ravine. And as big as that thing was, he cloaked. I mean, he disappeared in the twinkling of an eye. Right. And so uh, I would measure that thing. Uh, it was about up to the... Uh, on all fours, you looked like it was about uh, eight feet long and about almost five feet tall. At the on shoulders? All fours. Do what? At, at the shoulders, five foot, or five foot at the head? At the head, five foot at the head, tall, but it's on all fours. It was eight feet long. Right, right. So he was a big And that was a big one. Yeah. Yeah. And my parents freaked out. I had a gun in the car. I could have kept a 357 Magnum. And my parents said, go on, don't you say a word. Everybody that sees these things with me freaks them out so bad, scares them so bad, they tell me to shut up. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to, don't you talk about it. Right. So I kept silent for 20-some years. Well, I think that's a big thing down south is because, you know, since starting this channel, I've talked to a lot of people. And a majority of them are from down south. And, you know, they just, they see them. And they see them a lot down there. But they just shut up. And they don't talk about them. No, you know, because they're, 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 well, first of all, who's going to believe? Right. Maybe at the privacy of the dinner table or something, you know, or whatever. I don't think it's that. I think that people are so scared, uh, Jeffrey, that they, uh, they just, it's like you're scared. Uh, scared silent. Yeah. And yeah. and they and, and people people are seeing more of these things down there. I somebody a forty year researcher called me up, came from Lion Strikers group and you know, he was telling me some things about, about the waterway. Mm -hmm. I said he worked on the waterway when it was being developed seventy four to eighty five. Okay, uh he saw he saw Bigfoot, and he saw Dog Man, and they were like Dog Man was orange, and the Bigfoot was big. He went camping down there in one of the uh, camping grounds they they built on Bay Springs Lake. That's the first lake as you leave Pickford, you got to go down a thirty three mile divide cut. Uh, there's a campground. I actually camped, you know, years later I camped there, but he he hoisted. He, he cooked several quart Boston butts, put them in coolers and, and put them up on a, about 10 or 12 feet off the ground. And he knew that, that the Bigfoot were in there, I thought. So he was telling me the story. He said he was sleeping in a tent. I go, why in the world would you sleep in a tent knowing mm -hmm. these things are down there? You, you like Tim Quimbo Becker, you ain't scared of nothing. Right. And so he told me, he says, he heard a commotion and they broke open the two uh, boxes and got those two Boston butt spoke shoulders out and took off with them. And when he woke up the next morning, he saw a brim of pine cones like Bigfoot saying, thank you for the meal. You know, like a pine cone, uh, a, a seashell, a, a, a like mussel shell, like a, little gift. a brim. Yeah. That's the way Bigfoot shows their, you know, thankful, uh, you know, the gratitude that you fed them. Yeah, yeah. Now, that waterway there, I remember you telling me a story a while ago about a helicopter crashing or something. Was that at that waterway too? Or no, not? that was uh, actually, that was, uh, if you if you look on WHNT TV out of Huntsville, Alabama, uh -huh. it, the story's on there about the helicopter that a uh, guy was flying over, I guess, checking transmission lines that would, you know, cross the river and stuff. And so he got disabled and he went across the the, mm -hmm. the Natchez Trace Bridge and he went across on the Culver County, Alabama side. And uh, 
I remember Kumba was telling me about uh, there's dog. I mean, Bigfoot all up and down the waterway through there. Yeah, he, that's just not too. That's not far from where he lives. No, around Sheffield, Alabama, he lives out from Sheffield, but it's not that far from where Sheffield. And the guy radioed and he said he he kind of he had to emergency land the helicopter. And they said, don't move, do not get back to that helicopter, and don't move from that area. I'm thinking a Bigfoot came out, and he saw it. He got back in that helicopter and tried to fly it over across to the Lauderdale County, Alabama side, and crashed 50 feet before the shoreline, and bass fishermen saw it go down. And he had a panic look, and it, it happened so quick that, you don't know to react to drive over there and try to save his life. It's like, I can't believe this happened. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't believe I saw mm -hmm. a Bigfoot. Right. Like, it, it freaks people out. And there's two bass fishermen, you know, time they got started with the helicopter, it always sank. And it was, uh, I think he sank in 50 foot deep water, which he was still in the a river channel. And it took, uh, it, it, once they got there, the, the bastards from call the sheriff's department in uh, Florence, and they relate it to the uh, Carver County people, uh, which I think is uh, Muscle Shoals area. Okay. And so they finally got some help out there, and it took maybe about two or three days to find the helicopter. It took 10 days to recover the body. Hmm. And it, was, it had floated almost toward uh, Waterloo, Alabama. Wow. And that's about five river miles north of there. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely squatch out that way. I Yeah, and Tim Kumbo told me personally on the phone that he was out bass fishing in Bear Creek, yeah. and that's right across from Waterloo, and uh, it was broad daylight, and the sun was out, and here, here comes a Bigfoot coming right out of the woods and strolling down the beach like he owned the place. Yeah. Yeah. And K Kumbo is like maybe about 50 to 70 yards out in the middle of Bear Creek. He saw it. Yeah, well, look, I mean, yeah, I remember him talking, me and him talking, and I went on the on a map, and he goes, look at that. And, he, you know, we kind of pinpointed where he grew up, and he goes, and, and right there is Booger Bottom. And you know why they yeah. call it Booger Bottom. And, yeah, it was pretty crazy, pretty intense down there. So, um, you know, Tim, he, he always says he's never seen the dog man, but he went camping at LBL. And I think my friend Walker DeSazer was there, but he was in his truck camper and not too far from where Tim's tent was. And the guy was sitting mm -hmm. around the fire and Tim dog, he has German shepherds and he was on his cop pad where the dog freaked out and tried to go up under Tim's, Tim's, uh, cot. And he bumped him awake, and it's like three thirty in the morning, and his dog was freaking out, you know. Yeah. And Tim didn't know what was going on. The guy at the fire saw it, and you know he didn't. See, he just froze right where he was, and uh, the the dog man was six foot behind Tim Baker's tent. Yeah. I said, Tim, get you a tank. Don't sleep in no tent. Yeah, I heard that story too. Yeah. Yep. Now, um, and so, that one, the, the thing that you were just talking about before we got on to talking about Tim real quick, you had kind of talked about a black cow. You had mentioned black cow. But there is something that you stumbled across during your years of life and travel and, and, and traveling along the, the waterways that you heard some law enforcement kind of uh talk about codes for these things one time yeah uh i was at lbl at lake barkley state resort park with scott we were uh we boated up and uh i'm, I'm thinking it was um 2010 i'm thinking that's when it was uh 09 or, or 10 and so we were we had pulled up at the marina's big old six foot six uh game warden kentucky state game warden came over there and you know sniffed around the boat he said what are y'all doing up here i thought we're just out here sightseeing you know looking at different terrain and eagles and all that stuff 
And he looked, well, how come men got no fishing gear? I said, like I told you, we're up here looking for eagles. We're not, we're not fishermen. And he kind of looked around the boat. I said, well, look, just go ahead and look the boat over. So he got in and looked around and couldn't find any contraband with marijuana and what he's looking for or, or hard liquor. And I said, well, I told you we don't do that. And uh, he looked at me and goes, is that your boyfriend? I said, no, that's my cousin. You know, and he, he made me mad. I thought, all right, you butthead. Right. And so Scott and I went up here and got a room. And uh, so I was sitting in there. Scott was talking to his girlfriend. So I saw them sitting at a round table. I went over there and sat directly behind that big old state park uh, uh, or ranger, uh, wildlife officer. And uh, he looked at me. I said, well, he had to talk to his girlfriend. He had to have some privacy. So I was sit, drinking some coffee. And I leaned in as he was leaning up toward the table, and they were talking about Dog Man and Bigfoot. But they were calling it Black Cow, which would, would be uh, Sasquatch, and Black Dog is uh, Dog Man. Mm. And they were using those code names, and they were saying that when you get called out, uh, a radio patrol call from the uh, like Sheriff's Department or whatever, whoever dispatched your calls to you, always, they'll always say black cow or black dog. That way you know how to be on high alert and call for backup. And so that's what they would call them. And uh, I found out in Tennessee circles about some law enforcement officers I went to academy with at Donaldson in 81 that they investigated a call at Fort Pella State Park Campground, which is uh, uh, on the Mississippi River Bluff, overlooking the Mississippi River bottoms. And they, uh, these two bicyclists were bicycling from like New Orleans all the way up to Minnesota. And they were coming out of Memphis and got held up. And they should have stayed at uh, Mean and Shelby Forest State uh, Park but they went ahead and pressed it and they got to Fort Pella, you know, right as it got dark, set up their tents and they were the only ones down on that end. They were like on the end, there's other campers up toward the front of the park. And uh, apparently two dog men came up, grabbed them and pulled them out of their tent and just, you know, slaughtered them right there, tore them up real bad. And so the, uh, People were walking, came up on the tent, and ran down there and got the uh, called the park ranger, and they got up there and uh, then the then the, I think the highway patrol and the sheriff's department, Lauderdale County, Tennessee sheriff's department was up there, and uh, they said uh, black dog tore them up, mm. which they were mean dog man, but but they said a pack of wild dogs came up there. I mean, tore them up tore the tent up, I mean, pulled them out of the tent and just ripped them up. Yeah. And so, you know, there's things that saying it's, there's a lot of things that are going on is what's not being said. Like the Cock County people that got tore up. Yeah. All right. They're saying probably cougar, mountain lion, uh, uh, panther, bear, or something. Well, they blamed... That's doing they blamed- it. They blamed a guy and his dogs on that. Yeah. And and the three dogs that were found by Amber Miller were licking her, which dogs do when you're bleeding. They yeah. weren't they weren't dangerous. And a good Samaritan <clears throat> was able to <clears throat> excuse me, was able to get Amber Miller or the dogs away and not get bit. <clears throat> so none of it makes sense there. You know, it's They've got these, they, they just want to keep it, keep it hush hush and quiet for some reason. And uh, it makes no sense to me. It's, it's, it's more, da- I think it's more dangerous keeping the secret than letting the public know, you know, they, they treat us like we're kids for gosh sakes. Well, there's a deal up in Monroe mm. County, Kentucky, which is 
just to the northeast of Nashville, Tennessee. And the sheriff's department went out there and they tore up. They they didn't really tear them up. They just removed the heart and, you know, they scratched them around the neck and they bled to death a, a donkey and some other farm livestock. Yeah. And the sheriff's department goes, and the, so the uh, DNR, Kentucky DNR came out and then the wildlife officer came out and said that was uh, probably done by, uh, you know, cougar or mountain lion or whatever. And the sheriff said, I ain't having no part of this. So he found somebody that that knew about the black dog, black bear, and what it meant. And so he wouldn't have anything. He was leaning toward the, the black dog, but really the dog man what he was leaning toward. Mm-hmm. But the DNR shut him down. He said, you cannot talk about these things being dog man or walking wolves or any of that stuff. you got to go by our codes and what we use. You do not discuss this in public. You know, this is something we have to hide under these code mm-hmm. names. Right. And so they shut him down. Yeah. He said, we can, we can have you removed from office if you keep this up. And so they shut the man down, but he wasn't buying it. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, crazy. you know, this is it's stuff is it's going on and has gone on for such a long time, but it's being blamed on other creatures that are doing the killing when we know it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And there's stuff that goes mm-hmm. around Pickwick Lake. I mean, there are, right, I was driving, well, I, one of the things I used to do is drive around the, you know, just, Look at the lay of the land and, you know, see what's going on. I guess by old patrolman days, I kind of started doing that again. I saw a guy cutting hay. Uh, it's usually around June when they do that. This guy had a 30 out 6 with a scope riding shotgun with him. Mm-hmm. I go, I ain't never seen that before. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And then we had we had all these fires up around Bruton Branch and uh, up around Pompey's and Dry Creek area, and they would go in and and just ransack the kitchen, get all the food out, and then set the thing on fire. I said, why have they got to burn the cabin down? You know, it just take the food and go. And of course, that didn't make sense because that dog man, they'll tear up a, they'll tear up a. Uh, inside of your home and stuff yeah but how are they going to set the fire that's well you know they can scratch the wires and stuff yeah that's true that's true unless the police were doing that to cover it up too you know well you never know about that you think insurance company goes in and sees all these gash marks and stuff how are we going to explain this well that's true quit that's true you know so, like yeah. you just said, there's a lot of things going around in in your area. Um, All the time. Yeah. Well, let's take Dogman out of the equation. And you've seen some other strange things that that almost resemble a reptilian. And yeah, you're... this was uh, this was at my home. I live on uh, I live in North Wings. North Wind Springs, I'm not going to tell you the street I live on, but uh, right. anyway, it's between mm-hmm. uh, Docks, it's between Pawnee Cove, Dockside Cove Road, and Windy Pine. Having our house redone uh, after my parents, were, mother had passed away and dad was in a nurse home still alive, and this was 2017 into 2018, and this was in August or, or early part of September, and the reason I can tell you that is because the oak leaf hydrangeas, when they're really pretty in uh, May and June, but you get on into uh, August and September, usually have a drought problem and the heat's real bad. And they'll turn a, a kind of a faded green and a yellow color to it. I was sitting there in the uh, guard room on a futon bed, uh, just, you know, listening to uh, encounter shows, mm-hmm. probably years too. And uh, anyway, um, I saw something coming out of uh, Dockside Cove Road, and uh, it it uh, was coming toward the carport. I happened to look up just as it was 
between the carport and the uh, big pine tree where the oak leaf hydrangeas are real thick in there. And the color on that matched the hydrangeas, a yellowish green. And I looked, I was had perfect shot. I was about uh, 15 feet off the ground and I had a perfect line of sight which is about 25 or 30 feet from this thing. And it was the size of that 2014 Nissan Sentra four-door I have, but it was crouched down real low. So it only came up to maybe the where the uh, door and the window met. And uh, it had it was all crouched down, and I it had the... In, the skin had the... It looked like the embedded beads on the spalling basketball. Okay. And uh, it 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 saw a car go by and it crashed down and it went behind that pine tree and I had a good shot then and then as soon as the pine tree lit it took off but it stayed down low on all fours running like a lizard and for at first I thought it was a dog man and I go that's no dog man right. you know and it it now that I think about it it looked more reptilian. And there's one thing I I made a uh, search on all the rivers in in Tennessee, and the Tennessee River, and the Cumberland River, and the Forked Deer River, and the Obine River, and uh, let's see, the Lusahatchee and the Hatchee are twelve thousand years old. Now it makes you wonder what's really in those rivers. Yeah. And, you know, mm-hmm. when I went down to the Ten Time Waterway, we went all the way down to the, I got down almost to the last lock and dam, and uh, the lock, lock operator wouldn't let us through. We might go make his way to about 10 hours. And so we were coming back up to the Mopolis uh, Yacht Basin, and we saw these two guys. They were stranded on a, out in the middle, so we hauled them back to the boat ramp. And I asked him, I said, I said, how far is this from Mobile? And he said, about 30 miles. And I said, are there any sharks in here? He goes, oh, man, there's like nine and ten foot bull sharks. Don't get in this water mm-hmm. like that. Because I, I had a feeling there were. Okay, now the waterway's been open since June of 85, and this is 37 years later. If a lock swings open and a boat goes in, no matter the size, how come a bull shark couldn't go in there with them? And then when the lock swings open, as you stair step it up toward Lake Pickwick, at the end, a bull shark can go up through there. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Just follow its way. I mean, they're yeah. They're and not if, you, dumb. if you if you <clears throat> if you look on uh, YouTube, it's got Cole Walker, C O L E Walker, uh, bull shark Pickwick Lake, and he's got on a pink, like a pink golf shirt. And he's giving us, us talk about bull sharks. He said he encountered across from Pickwick State Park in the, the deepest area of Pickwick Lake is right in there at 148 feet deep. And uh, uh, that's just about a little about half a fourth of a mile past, you know, at, before you get to Pickwick Dam where the uh, turbines are. And uh, he's he said he saw a nine foot bull shark and it hit his boat like rammed and hit it a couple of times and he got his boat and took off. I think it was his uncle or somebody. And then they got off the water and, and he was given a uh, presentation at, at like, I think one of the restaurants around here and the, in the audience was by two dentists in there. So I asked him, I said, was he telling the truth about that bull shark? He goes, well, we, he appeared that he was, and I got to thinking, what else is around here? Yeah, yeah. If you know, bull, I mean, I mean, how, how long has Dog Man actually been here? For a long time, I'm afraid. A very long I think, time. I think these Dog Man and Bigfoot creatures have been in these, all right, LBL was made into a national park a, a federal funded park in 1963. Yep. I think they were there all along, and the only way they could get them to uh, people get that people out of the area were to move them out. 
and make that a fairly funded part. I remember that was about first grade. I remember them taking people out like Golden Pond, Kentucky, and, you know, just little small areas <clears throat> where people lived and stuff, and uh, making that a federal park. And I got to looking at that. I, I, I said, that struck an oddity in me. So when I looked down at uh, Harpensville Road, there's a place called Benville National Forest, and the Mississippi Bigfoot Club goes down there, you know, and, and then there's a guy named Don Peak, uh, wildlife deal. He's on Facebook. That's somebody I wish you'd get on your show is Don Peak. I don't know how to, I'll, I'll try to send him an email to get him to ca call you or, you know, email you and I'll, I'll send him that information. All right. But yeah, if you do that, I appreciate he, that. He goes up to the LBL and all that. He called a dog man. And I said, well, all right, let me ask you a question. Now, this looks like the Anubis dog man. Okay. I mean, you can see him plain as day. And uh, I said, how far away were you when you took that dog man shot? He said, about 300 yards. I said, that's still pretty close. And uh, and he was he was kind of hung over a log, had them big pointed ears looking directly at him. And there was like a little uh, creek or, or uh branch or something between them and i think that was up at lbl hmm. yeah if you don't mind do that for me i'd appreciate that yeah i like to hear what and he's he's shown me some dogman uh uh sightings and uh he's real big into cryptids and he he goes and finds these you know I th and he counts in a 10 i go you must have a uh he like kumbo y'all must be superman yeah. You know, sleeping in tents and during these dog man and Sasquatch. And I asked him, I said, You reckon dog man smells your campfire and your coffee cooking and stuff? He goes, Yeah, I'm sure he does. Yeah. That's so there's, there's stuff that's going on that has been going on that we don't really know how long this has been going on. No, and, I, think, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said the rivers in that area. 12,000 years old. 12,000 years old. You know, the, there was a glacier all throughout that area. I think when everything kind of melted and things kind of turned lush again, these creatures followed, you know, found a, a beautiful habitat with water, plenty of food, plenty of shelter, everything it needs. Yeah. And just settled in. Um, and unfortunately... You know, the people are so scared and so afraid that they don't want to they don't want to get ridiculed, first of all, uh, by seeming crazy that they see these things. And, and I'm sure that you have mm -hmm. if you're going to work on a federally funded uh, program like building lakes and dams, railroads, uh, the Natural Trace Parkway, uh, anything like that, a national the military parks and stuff, you have to probably sign a disclosure. Whatever you see, you leave in, you tell us and we'll tell you what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure more than likely so you'd have to any kind of thing like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure they have to sign a, you can't go tell what you saw on these fairly funded lands. Yeah. Kind of like and Vegas. So, what stays, what happens here stays here. That's right. <laughs> and so, I think I think a lot of things have gone unreported, or or have been reported, but are not being told correctly. Yeah. And your show is now illuminating that to everybody who tunes into your show. You have expounded since I came on two years ago, about a year ago, came on to your show, and I said Jeffrey is really expounding his limits and really incorporating the UFOs, the aliens, the reptilians is all true. It needs to be, it needs to be told. Yeah. Everything needs to be shared. I think there's, there's a connection, you know, and I don't, I don't know what the connection is, but I want to figure it out. And I think that. By you do an extra job, by the way. Thank you very much. That means I don't, a lot I'm not time. mean to be a brown nose, but you really are. When you get, <laughs> when you get Tim Kumbo Baker come on top for two hours. Yeah, that was a good show. I had a good time with him. He's a great guy. He is a great guy. 
Listen, we're coming up on time. Um, do me a favor. Don't hang up. Um, but is there anything that you'd like to say to the audience before we uh, end the interview? I'd like to tell everybody that listens to Jeffrey show. Please tell people. Let's get his uh, subscriber if subscribers up over a certain amount because this man is truthful. He's honest, and he's telling it point blank. Can't beat that. I appreciate that. It means a lot coming from you, sir. It really does. You've been around for a long time, and you know a lot of people. And, you know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't know Kunbo. So, you know, well, I appreciate I, I, it. You're welcome on that. You're welcome. So, all right, my friend, don't hang up. It was great talking okay. to you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Good night. Donald Coleman Jr., a man of information and just a really, really nice, nice guy. Um, like we said in the interview, he is responsible for Kunbo and my friendship. Um, if I didn't meet Donald, I wouldn't have met Kunbo. So <laughs> it's crazy how things work out. Anyway. I know Mr. Coleman has some other things that he is wanting to share with us very soon. So we may be getting another dose of Donald in the next couple of days or within a week. I got some other subscribers that I've got to reach out to. And later today, I'm going to do a special announcement on the channel. A little issue that happened, which I think I'm on the radar. I think I'm finally on the radar. Anyway, with that, stay safe, stay healthy. May the Great Spirit watch over us all. May He guide us down that path that we call life.